Dr. David Spiegel, the world's leading researcher and clinician in the field of hypnosis. The Associate Chair of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine. Published over 480 journal articles. 170 book chapters. A powerhouse in the field of science. Truly the world expert in hypnosis and clinical applications of hypnosis for mind and body. It's an ability that many of us have and we underutilize. Britain's number one hypnotherapist. Today's guest is Marissa Peer. Speaker, best-selling author, columnist, and advisor to the stars. Marissa Peer is an international best-selling author. She's a leading celebrity therapist. She is a worldwide renowned therapist. I am enough is her movement. Hi, I'm Dr. David Spiegel. Hi, this is Marissa Peer. Welcome to the show. I'm actually so honored that Dr. Spiegel is here because I've been a fan of you since I became a hypnotherapist in 1984. You you were the one who wrote so eloquently about it and, and really made it mainstream because, you know, so many people think hypnotherapy is woo-woo, but when you have a medical doctor who's so eloquent in it, it really gives it that stamp of approval that it's needed for such a long time. But So I'd love to start by asking you, where did your interest in hypnotherapy come from? I know it's a passion of yours and you've devoted pretty much your life to it, but where did that begin? Uh, well, thank you, Marissa. I'm delighted to be here and I'm very impressed at the the worldwide following that you have created and teaching um, hypnosis and hypnotherapy to them. Uh, hypnosis is something of a genetic illness in my family. Both of my parents were psychiatrists and psychoanalysts and they told me that I was free to be any kind of psychiatrist I want to be, so here I am. My father um, was offered a free course in hypnosis by a Viennese refugee uh, at the beginning of World War II uh, who had escaped um, uh, from Austria. He was a forensic psychiatrist who had a smallpox scar on the middle of his forehead, and he noticed that when he was interviewing prisoners, they would suddenly sort of nod off and act differently. And he got interested in hypnosis, he couldn't serve in the U.S. forces, so he volunteered to teach young army doctors. So my father was taught in, in the middle of his psychoanalytic training, hypnosis. Now, Freud had given it up, so who was he to, to do it? But he got interested, and he was helping soldiers with combat stress reactions and pain control. When he got back, he went back to his analytic work, but he continued to use hypnosis. And after a while, he began to discover when he made follow-up calls to his patients, that many of them were getting more from the hypnosis sessions he did than the years of psychoanalysis. And so the dinner table conversation was pretty interesting. And when I got to medical school, I thought, well, I ought to take a course in this. And I did. And the moment that transformed me was my fr first patient in pediatrics uh, at Children's Hospital in medical school. Uh, the nurse said, Spiegel, your your patient is in room 342. She's in status asthmaticus. She can't breathe. And uh, we, we've tried epinephrine twice. It didn't work. We're thinking of general anesthesia. Go see what you can do. So I walk in, and there's this 15-year-old girl, knuckles white, struggling for breath. Her mother standing there in tears, the nurse in the room. And uh, the next step was going to be general anesthesia. I wasn't going to do that. I didn't know what else to do. So I thought, well, maybe I'll try hypnosis. So I said, you want to learn a breathing exercise? And she nods. And I got her hypnotized and then realized that we hadn't gotten to asthma in the course yet. So I came up with a very subtle, clever suggestion. I said, each breath you take will be a little deeper and a little easier. And uh, we'll talk more about mindsets and growth mindsets. But I realize now that that was kind of a growth mindset suggestion. And within about five minutes, she's lying back in bed and she's not wheezing anymore. And um, her mother stopped crying. The nurse ran out of the room. My intern came looking for me and I thought he was going to say, nice job, Spiegel. He said, the nurse has filed a complaint with the nursing supervisor that you violated Massachusetts law by hypnotizing a minor without parental consent. Now, Massachusetts has a lot of weird laws, but that's not on the list. And her mother was standing right next to me. And he said, you'll have to stop doing this. And I said, why? He said, it's dangerous. I said, well, now you're about to give her general anesthesia and steroids, and my talking to her is dangerous. And this, Marissa, as I'm sure you know, is kind of the history of hypnosis. We don't get no respect. It's the oldest Western conception of psychotherapy. But people either think it's a stage show trick or it's dangerous. And it's why I'm so inspired to see the many, many hundreds of people that you have trained who are listening to us today. Um, so. I um, uh, I 
told him that he could take me off the case if he wanted, but I was not going to tell my patient something I knew was not true. And so he stopped off the attending uh, and the chief resident had a meeting over the weekend and they came up with a radical resolution to the problem. They said, let's ask the patient. I don't think they'd ever done that before. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, I like this. Now she'd been hospitalized every month for three months, did have one subsequent hospitalization, but went on to study to be a respiratory therapist. And I thought that anything that could help a patient that much, that fast, violate a non-existent Massachusetts law and frustrate the head nurse had to be worth looking into. And I've been doing it ever since. And uh, it, it's particularly because you can see it happening right in front of you. Yeah, I see somebody said, Rodney Dangerfield, we don't get no respect. That's that's who we are. The, Rodney Dangerfield is this wonderful comedian. That was his tagline. And he okay. said... Uh, they once asked me to leave a bar so they could start happy hour, you know. So um, I, I, um, I just kept doing it. And I used it now with about 7,000 patients and research subjects. And uh, my sense of wonderment, it, it matches my patient's sense of wonderment when they can they surprise themselves. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about working with hypnosis is people see themselves doing things they never even thought they could do and very quickly. And so um, uh, I've been doing research uh, and clinical work with hypnosis my entire career, uh, learning about what happens in the brain when we do it. And uh, so it has kept me busy and interested, and I am delighted to see that it is finally starting to get some respect. But your story is interesting. It reminded me of a story. I was teaching at Imperial medical college in London. And one of the doctors came up to me and said, hey, my little girl of six has a terrible problem bedwetting. And it's very distressing for her because she can't go to sleepovers and gets upset when we go to visit grandmother for the weekend. So she brought her in and we did hypnosis. And we just imagined she had this little barbie wire going from her tummy to her mind. And when the tummy was full of wee wee, obviously you don't say bladder with a little girl of six, it, the barbie lit, lit up and she jumped out of bed and used the potty. And it worked immediately. And the doctor was selling her bed and she went, that's dangerous. You could medicate her for that, you know. And I thought, isn't that amazing? <laughs> the doctor colleague would say, but that's dangerous. You let someone hypnotize your daughter. You could have just given her medication. And so, and that wasn't very long ago. So it still does happen. People still do have a misconception about what it is and what it does. But I'd love to know, what is your approach to hypnosis? There's so many approaches. I know you, you have your own, and I'd love to hear what mm -hmm. it is. Well, uh, my approach to it um, is to teach people um, how to make better use of the three-pound organ at the top of their head. You know, it's connected to every part of the body, but it doesn't come with a user's manual. So what seems strange about hypnosis is simply that it's an aspect of mental function that we don't take full advantage of. Um, I, I think of hypnosis as having three major components. The first is absorption, getting so caught up in the center of attention, it's like looking through a telephoto lens, which you see, you see with tremendous detail. Um, and that allows you to concentrate well, to get into focused or flow states where you're totally engaged in what you're doing. And in order to do that, you dissociate, you put outside of conscious awareness things that would ordinarily be in consciousness. So right now, the people listening hopefully are more interested in what we're talking about, Marissa, than the sensations in the bottom of their feet touching the floor. But now that I mention it, hopefully they are aware of it. If they're too aware of it, we could we could stop now. Um, but I, our brain does this all the time. It handles a tremendous amount of information. And in hypnosis, you intensify the focus and therefore de-intensify the periphery. You can dissociate, put things outside of conscious awareness. And that's a tremendous value, too, because you can do that with pain, for example. You can filter the hurt out of the pain, um, focus on something else, transform the sensation of pain into some other feeling. So the brain is a tremendous information processor that we have much more control over than we'd like to think. The third part um, used to be called suggestibility. I don't like that word because it scares people. You know, it's like, I can make you do anything I want. And in fact, uh, we've done some studies recently. Uh, uh, my postdoc in my lab, Afik Fairman, who's now the head of the hypnosis division of uh, the American Psychological Association. And I did a study in which we had people who were highly hypnotizable uh, and, and non-hypnotizable do a continuous performance task where um, it, it's a set shifting uh, 
test in which you 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 can give answers to questions, but gradually your ability to get the right answer will change because the rules of the game are changing, only they're not telling you what it is. So people who can set shift quicker get higher scores on the continuous performance test. That's associated with hypnotizability. So what it means is it's a kind of cognitive flexibility. It's a capacity to change your perspective. And I think it's one of the most interesting things about hypnosis. Um, and uh, the, the idea that you can kind of um, sort of uh, suspend your normal sense of who you are, and we understand something about the neurophysiology of that now, means that you can try out being different and see what it feels like. And that's a tremendous therapeutic opportunity. You know, you don't have to wonder why you got to be the way you are. You don't have to explore that. Uh, you don't have to think yourself through it step by step. And that's the thing that scares people. You know, the stage shows, you know, they have the football coach dancing like a ballerina. I don't like making fun of people in front of large audiences, but there is a lesson there for people. And that is you can just try out being different, in, inhabit that person and see what it feels like. And there's all kinds of opportunities for taking on a different mindset, a growth mindset, learning to manage your pain, um, uh, help your body relax to the point where you can get to sleep, um, take a different point of view about a habit like smoking or the way you eat. So absorption, dissociation, and cognitive flexibility, that's what I think of hypnosis as. What word would you use instead of suggestibility? Because I have clients who they think suggestibility means gullible. Oh, I'm a gullible right. person. That's and right. They don't get it. They've actually, being suggestible can be a, a phenomenal gift. I mean, most artists are incredibly suggestible. But what word would you use instead that, would, that people would find easier to accept than suggestibility? Well, I, th I think it is flexibility. It's cognitive flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. highly hypnotizable people are, they take in things. They, you know, they're the kind of people who get so caught up in a movie that they forget they're watching a movie and enter the imagined world. It's a capacity to suspend judgment and just mm -hmm. immerse yourself in an experience and see what it feels like. Um, so I, I think of it more as flexibility, and it's got a more positive feel yeah. to it uh, than suggestibility. I like that. So I'd love to ask you another question. Tell me about your Reverie app and why in particular did you decide to create that? Thank you, Marissa. Uh, yeah, Reverie is a, a kind of a favored, favorite legacy project uh, of mine. You know, I thought when I started my career that if we just do enough research and, you know, understand what's happening in the brain, which we have a pretty good understanding of now, um, do randomized clinical trials showing uh, that hypnosis is effective, we would get a different reaction from people than the one that you got with a doctor saying, well, why'd you do something dangerous like hypnosis when you could have given a medication, you know? Uh, and, you know, that it, it, it is troubling me more and more because that attitude is responsible for the fact that in, in the United States last year, 88,000 people died of opioid overdoses. And these were mostly not suicides. These were people who just took too much uh, opioid suppressed respiration and people just went to sleep and didn't wake up. It's a terrible tragedy. And the CDC is expecting 111,000 this year. So tell me that, you know, have, have neither of us, I don't think, has ever succeeded in killing anyone with hypnosis yet. I, I haven't. I doubt that you have either. Yeah. And so this idea that it's somehow terrible, it's either ridiculous or dangerous, but the fact that it can help people manage pain, stress, get to sleep, um, manage their eating better, uh, stop smoking without medication. And the worst thing that happens with hypnosis is that it doesn't work, you know, that, how, how awful, but it very often does. So I thought, you know, I've tried this all my career and I haven't moved the needle very much. You know, you've taught a whole lot of people that's wonderful. I teach people too, um, and I see a lot of patients but um, I wanted, I decided to do what in the business world we call D to C, you know, direct to consumer. I thought um, it, hypnosis is interesting and safe enough that we can just make it available to anybody who wants it. And that's our goal with Reverie. So Reverie is a digital interactive hypnosis app. Ariel Poehler um, <clears throat> is a serial entrepreneur trained at MIT and Stanford Business School. And he came up to me after a Brain Mind Summit talk uh, four years ago 
uh, and I was talking about hypnosis and it was when Alexa, the Alexa app was just getting popular and they were making it easy for people to build interactive programs because I wanted something that wasn't just listening to me, but was interactive the way I am with my patients in the office. So we built the app so that I'll say, you know, is your hand floating up in the air? Are you feeling, is it feeling light? If yes, I go on to something else. If not, we analyze that response and I help reinforce that. So it's a kind of branch chain interactive hypnosis experience uh, with me. And I thought uh, we started out trying it for stopping smoking and um, we tested it. And it turned out that one out of five people just listening to the Alexa app stopped smoking. Now, I wish it were more than one out of five, but that's about as good as you get with Verena Clean and Bupropion and, uh, and Nicorette. And so I thought, well, that's a good start. And then Ariel said, you know, people don't like their Alexa speakers listening to them in the kitchen, and um, we ought to build an app. So we started a company, Reverie. We now have 16 people in the company, and um, we've had about half a million downloads so far, and we're hoping to make what we've learned can help people teaching them to teach them to help themselves to take control of their own hypnotic experience. And my, my conceptualization, Marissa, is that all hypnosis really is self-hypnosis that, that you're learning to master and use your own mind. And what a person, a therapist does is teach you how to do it and help you formulate a strategy that is the best way to help you solve the problem as you've done with your approach. So, um, but I, I, you know, I, I will admit that 30 or 40 years ago, I wouldn't have dared to do it. You know, you've got this app out there hypnotizing people everywhere. Um, uh, I've decided after all my years at, uh, working on it, that it's a good idea. It works and it's, it's safe and effective. Yeah, I know when I first became a hypnotherapist, you couldn't, and I've been from television, you can't hypnotize anyone on television because the whole audience will go to hypnosis and they, they might right. never come out. Of it. And I'm like, but where right. are these people who've never come out of hypnosis? They're not in a warehouse somewhere. They're not in a hospital. There isn't anyone right. in the world right. who's never come out of it. But I've noticed actually in the last 10 years that people are now doing hypnosis on television and it no longer has that tremendous fear that, gosh, I could hypnotize you and you might never come out of it. And you're talking about never coming out of anesthesia, which is a big worry. But hypnosis, as we know, is completely safe. It's a natural state. You'll go in and out of it all day long. But a lot of people have asked me, so I'm going to ask you, because you're so eminent, what would you say is the difference between hypnosis and self-hypnosis? Well, in a, in a formal sense, Marissa, uh, hypnosis is... Um, a state of highly focused attention that typically in the way it's been done is it's done with someone who is directing you how to take the steps to go into a hypnotic state. And, um, it doesn't have to take very long. You, you've emphasized rapid, uh, inductions and treatment. And, uh, it's something that is a structured experience, but my own feeling is that at its, at, in its heart, all hypnosis is really self-hypnosis, that in formal hypnosis, I teach someone how to do it or you teach someone how to do it, but people can do it for themselves if they learn to do it and and take that approach. And uh, that's what we teach people to do with Reverie. I just show them how to do it the way I show my patients in the office and um, they learn to do it for themselves. And you can either do it following the app, following instructions that are given, or you can just do it from your own internal recollection of what it's like but take the time to go into the state and focus on what you want to focus on. And um, we have uh, the Reverie app as an experience of doing that is available on the, the web at www.reverie.com. We're downloadable from the App Store or Google Play. And uh, we hope that people will play with it, that they'll learn that they have within themselves varying degrees of ability. Some people are more hypnotizable than others, but it's it's a way of teaching people to take full advantage of what their own brain enables them to do. I want to ask you this question. When you first started out, I know it was some time ago, how was it received? Because I know when I first started out, and that was in 1984, people would, would say, oh, you know, this is silly, this is hocus pocus, but you were already a doctor, a medical doctor. How were you received by the medical profession? I, it, uh, it, was a, it was a rough beginning. Um, people um, 
the one of my, the first patients, the first patient I had in my residency was a 16 year old girl who had been given 200 shock treatments by the age of 16. And I thought there's something wrong here. And um, uh, I filed a complaint with the commissioner of mental health and I tried to hypnotize her one day. She was depressed. Uh, understandably, she, her brain function was impaired by 200. I, you know, I've done ECT. It's a fine treatment, but not 200 in a teenager. And um, my, in front of the whole um, day hospital group where I was working as a physician, the supervising attending said, and I said, she's not hypnotizable in here. I think, well, here's why I think that's the case. She had all these shock treatments. And he said, did it ever occur to you that it's because you're a lousy hypnotist? Oh, so nice. that was a good start, you know. And I found that, um, you know, there were many psychiatrists back then, very psychoanalytic, who, who thought, well, Freud gave it up. Who are you, you know, to do it? And Freud found better things to do. Actually, you might get a kick out of this. Murder. Freud wrote in his autobiography that he was hypnot he was hip relieving a patient of her attacks of pain by tracing them back to their traumatic origins. And he said... She suddenly threw her arms around my neck, and he said, Freud wrote, I was modest enough not to attribute this event to my own irresistible personal attractiveness. So Freud discovered transference that day and decided that's why there's a couch in analysis, is that he moved his chair behind the couch because he was having patients open their eyes and free associate. Um, so uh, hypnotic phenomena occur, and we are trained to help people make the best possible use of them. But I honestly think that at its base, uh, what we're doing as hypnotherapists is just helping people make better use of an ability they have to varying degrees, but um, some people more than others. And I can talk about hypnotizability, which is one of the things we're very interested in. Um, but uh, I, I conceptualize it that way, Marissa. How, how do you How do you conceptualize it? Well, you know, I've noticed a huge change, for instance, about eight years ago, I was having a scan and... One of the nurses was saying, you know, you're so chilled in there. I said, oh, I was in hypnosis the whole time. I said, well, could, could you show us how to do that? Because we have a lot of young kids going into the scanner and they don't like it and they wriggle. And, of course, you've got to keep really still. So I said, of course. So I was teaching all the nurses how to get children to scan and how to get them into hypnosis and to tell them it was just like being in their own bed at night and they were sleeping. And so I've noticed that there's quite a change that many, many hospitals and doctors I find half the medical profession are really pro what I do and the other half probably not. But I still have this issue that medical insurance, they'll say, oh, um, we'll, we'll pay for insomnia, but not hypnotherapy for insomnia. So I've got to call it coaching or something else. So it's so bizarre that hypnotherapy for insomnia is amazing, but the medical providers will not cover it if it's hypnosis. We have to give it some other name like psychotherapy or talk therapy, even though the hypnotherapy is, has one session and the talk therapy has 25. And so I've always thought that's so, so um, <laughs> they're missing a trick when they say we're not paying for it. We don't want to pay to hypnotize someone to stop smoking, even though someone stopped smoking, that they would be less of a challenge and less of a cost to that insurance provider. So I found the medical profession are much better. I've got a lot of dentists who I went to see this, we said, oh, can I, can I do this under hypnosis? Because I've heard about you. And I said, sure, I'd love to see it. So I felt obliged to do that, but it was fine. It's the, Doing um, dental work under hypnosis, the hardest part is how much you have to concentrate to stay in that relaxed state, right, which right. is sort of contradictory. But I've always thought it odd that insurance companies will not cover for it. I had my daughter in hypnosis. I had lots of people, can I come and watch? And I'm like, sure, because they were so amazed that I could deliver a baby and, under hypnosis. But it was great. I was yeah. half asleep most of the time. So, yeah, I, right. that's been my yeah. bugbear, that insurances still don't like it when it saves well, them a huge amount of money. If, if I may, I'll tell you a story. My, my lovely wife, Helen, who's a professor of stem cell biology at Stanford, decided that she wanted to be in control of the delivery of our, our first child. Um, and, uh, uh, so she didn't have anesthesia. We did, we did hypnosis. She had hypnotic analgesia and, um, the labor was about 10 hours. Dan was 10 pounds when he was born. He was a big wow. child. And somewhere in the middle, I had her floating in Lake Tahoe, cool, tingling and numb. And, um, she said, you know, I teach pharmacology at Stanford. There are drugs for this. And I said, <laughs> just keep floating in Lake Tahoe. You'll be fine. <laughs> 
And I had no pain at all. Daniel was born fine. And um, uh, Helen uh, was proud of the fact that she was able to be in full control and, and that she was able to welcome Dan. She was alert and able to give him a big hug, uh, welcome him into the world. And she had our second child, Julia, in the same way. So uh, it, it indeed um, is effective and can be very helpful to people. But I'll tell you, you know, we, we talk about paradoxical suggestions. Um, it's a paradox, but frankly, insurance companies don't save money by doing the least expensive thing. They lose money, and here's why. Insurers make their money um, by investing what they get in in premiums before they have to pay them out in benefits. And mm. so the more money that is flowing through that pipeline, the more money they make. And so having something that's inexpensive um, and effective is not particularly appealing. And then you have the fact that they're, you know, big pharma makes a fortune on their drugs. Of course. And, of course. and they hire ex cheerleaders to go around telling doctors this is the thing to do. And that's why, you know, millions and millions of people have been put on opioids and gotten hooked on opioids uh, because the insurance companies make a lot of money selling, uh, not the insurance companies, the pharma makes a lot of money selling it. So I wish I could say that if you have something that's safe and effective, uh, insurance companies would go after it, but they don't. And that's why healthcare costs are getting higher and higher. Now, I prescribe medication. I'm a physician. There are good uses of them. There's no question oh. about it. It's oh. the array of treatments. But given the choice, using your brain first uh, and effectively in that way is always my first choice. But I don't ask the insurance company about it. We actually have a code, 90880, for hypnotherapy that will pay something for it. Oh, good. Um, but... Um, you're right. We we still don't get no respect uh, when it comes to billing for what we do. I was just going to ask you how what got you interested in hypnotherapy. You you talked about some early experiences. But... You know, I was told I could never have children. That I would never be able to get pregnant. And if I could get pregnant, I could never carry baby to full term. But um, so when I had a perfect baby, I remember thinking, oh, so I just began to work with infertile women who mostly had unexplained infertility, which I always thought was a very interesting word. Unexplained infertility. I mean, I know what explained is the fallopian tubes are blocked. There's no eggs. Um, the husband doesn't right. have any sperm. But I, unexplained was always fascinating to me. And I found it was always to do with all these, these blocks in the mind. And so I had great success with getting people who couldn't get pregnant, get pregnant, and people having IVF. And they'd often say to me, you know, uh, the doctor told me it's got a 25% success, but what they heard is a 75% failure rate. And, and they said it normally works after the third session. And I've always been fascinated by language patterns. That's such an odd thing to say someone. It usually works after session three, and you've got a 25% chance of it working. And so I would always, as you know, tell people different things. You know, I had some surgery a year and a half ago because I got run over. And I was interested that mm -hmm. all the nurses would say, how's your pain? So I'm not in pain. I'm in discomfort, but not pain. And discomfort, I could manage. As long as I got into one position and stayed there, and they, they kept trying. I said, you don't have to medicate discomfort. I don't want all this. And they sent me home with a bag full of pills. I said, I, said, I don't want them. I don't want even to flush them down the door. You should keep this. You know, you have to take them all home. And it was such a waste of money because I just threw them all away. I had to pay for them. But... um. It, it was the language that I found so interesting. Um, and so I was, two things took me into hypnosis. The one was being told I could never have a child and then having a perfectly healthy child who's just about to have her own child next month, which is very exciting. Wonderful. And Congratulations. Was, I, I was working for Jane Fonda teaching aerobics in Beverly Hills. And most of the girls coming to that studio were anorexic or bulimic or exercise or body yes. dysmorphic. And they were all trying to use aerobics to fix what was really a mental problem. It doesn't mean they were mentally ill, but it's that's anorexia you can't be cured with aerobics. Body dysmorphia can't be cured. And I realized that they were all trying to logically fix something that was deeply emotional. And that's why I love hypnosis, because you have all the emotional language patterns that, and you don't use logic. I, I love the rules of the mind, that emotion is more powerful than logic. And so if you're de dealing with telling someone it's like saying to an alcoholic, why don't you just have a cup of tea? They just look at you like you're crazy yeah. because it it makes sense, but it's not logical because you can't use logic when people are in pain 
whether that's physical pain because they have migraines or stomach, or whether it's emotional pain because they can't find love because they felt their father never loved them or they can't succeed because they lack confidence. So it was the ability to... So when I, I found, I studied with Gil Boyne, I'm sure you know of him, he, he loved mm. you. But I studied with a girl, girl boy, and I was so amazed at how quickly you, you could work with something as complex as anorexia or bulimia. And it always went back, I found, to girls who were trying to, they didn't want to grow up. They wanted to stay a child because they felt safe. So they were unconsciously trying to stop themselves. And only last year, I worked with this sweet girl who actually desperately wanted to be a boy and came from a very religious family where they wouldn't have, but she was, she was only eating two quail's eggs a day. She was so terribly ill, but I realized straight away with her that she didn't want to have breasts. That was her problem. She mm. couldn't stand mm. to develop like a girl because she'd got into the trans thing and thought she should be a boy. And uh, and just talking to her and hypnosis and darling, you know, you, don't, you, you can hide breasts, you can, all th- that you can do all kinds, you don't have to starve yourself. And when you're 18, you can do whatever you like. You can marry a girl, you can have lots of girlfriends or boyfriends, you can do anything you want to. But what you're doing is is not going to help you. And when you tell people stuff in hypnosis, they they receive it in a way they don't out of it. Something about being relaxed and a kind voice saying something, but using emotion rather than logic really worked for her. And immediately she began eating again, which was such a relief. That's a lovely story. And, you know, if I can reframe it in my terms, what you did there, is when we found when we put people into the functional magnetic resonance image scan or look at what happens in their brains when they go into hypnosis, three things happen that fit that story exactly. One is you turn down activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate gyrus. There's a, there's a C, an inverted C on its ends in the middle of your brain. The front part, the dorsal part, um, inv- is like our alarm system. It's the salience net, part of the salience network. So when there's a lot of noise and you respond, it's the dorsal ACC firing saying, look out, there's trouble there. If you can turn down activity in that area, you become more receptive. You're less worried that something bad is going to happen if you do it. So part of what you were doing was soothing her. Yeah. The second that thing that, yeah, and, and so you're turning down activity in that part of her brain. The second thing that we see happens is you connect activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the executive control network, with the insula. Insula is Latin for island, this little island of tissue in the middle of the front part of the brain that is a mind-body conduit. So it's the place where the, 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 the brain can very carefully control things going on in the body, in the GI system, physical sensation, also interoception, perceiving what's happening in the body and controlling it. So you're helping her to perceive her body differently. And the third thing is there is inverse connectivity between the executive control network and the posterior cingulate cortex, the back of that inverted C, which is our default mode network, it's where we conceive of who we are. When you're just sitting there and thinking, what am I like? What am I supposed to be? What do people expect me to be? That's the default mode network. And you can suspend activity in that part of the brain. And that's what you were doing. You say you have this rigid conception of what it means if you grow up and develop breasts and grow up like a woman. And you were allowing her to try out being different. You were giving her different models of how she could grow up. And rather than just think about it and discuss it, I'll bet she started to feel it. She could say, oh, yes, you know, I could let my body grow. I could take better care of my body. I could feed it better. But at the same time, I can be myself as I want to be. My body okay. will not determine it. I can help my body. My body will help me. And you were giving her a pathway to do it. And she could not just understand it but she could feel it. She could feel what life would be like. And that's how you helped her. So that's what I'm, from my perspective, uh, neurobiologically, you were doing when you gave her those hypnotic suggestions. Yeah. And it was such a lovely thing because I felt so bad for her. She was so confused, but of course that's what we do. We take someone who's very confused and we just separate out the confusion and, and make it okay. Yeah. Well, you, you give them a different framework that they can then adapt to. I, I had a young woman who was seven months pregnant, um, had terrible lower back disease. And so as the baby grew, she was in more and more discomfort. Um, and they put in a, a nerve stimulator that, that didn't work. They couldn't give her meds because she was pregnant. 
And so in hypnosis, I had her imagine she was floating in a, in a warm bath, filter the hurt out of the pain, just float. And uh, she, her pain was seven out of 10 when we started. It was three out of 10 by a few minutes later. But she looked angry. And I said, you're feeling better. What are you angry about? And she said, why in the hell are you the last doctor I got sent to instead of the first? You know? Yeah, I so, hear that. Yeah. People say that, yeah. you know, they, people tend to come to us when they've tried everything else. We're very rarely the first resort. We're almost often the last resort. I've tried everything. That's exactly right. And and then they're willing to, and they, they, it is frustrating that they can go to so many other places and get diagnosed with so many things. I, I'm a years ago working with someone yes. who was incredibly um, posh and she was telling me about her life and her depression. I said, I don't, you, you're not depressed, you're repressed. And suppress her father had died when she was very young. Yeah. And she always was a good girl. You know, she didn't want to upset anyone. So she was so good. And then she married someone. And she could never say boo to a goose. And, and her mother-in-law was very rude to her. And I said, you, you really need to stand up for yourself. This is not depression. It's repression. Open your mouth. And I actually got her to swear a little bit. And she she rather liked that because she'd never done it before. Because she was so interviewed. I said, darling, if being good makes you want to kill yourself, why didn't she be bad? Why didn't she be a little naughty or wild? Because if that's what being good has done for you, that here you are medicated and wanting to die, then it doesn't sound like being good is much fun. I think you should be bad. And so she said, I'm, I'm going straight off to out of Victoria's Secret. I said, good. And off she went. And she said, my husband's so happy because I thought I had to be so good. And this is all because, you know, the father died and the me message was, I've got to be a good girl. My poor mother, I must be good. But she told herself that message for so long and it actually was making her desperate because she's entered a race with no finishing line. You can't always be good. You can be good, but it's quite, sometimes it's nice to not be good, to say, I'm not going to be good today. I'm not going to have a perfect diet and go, I'm going to lie on the sofa and eat potato chips and watch TV and just be the opposite. And so, again, she just needs someone to give her permission to stop being so good because it was making her really unhappy. And as a mother herself, she was under so much pressure to be perfect, which is impossible. Yeah. So it's really well, nice to say, well, just, just live your life. You don't have to be good. Well, I've noticed how, how how people who use hypnosis often like to play with words like that. And I love your mm. reframing her very succinctly. Not You're not depressed, yeah. you're repressed. Um, yeah. Because uh, language has power. And if we so use it, particularly power. when people are in a state where they're open yeah. and receptive to experiencing, not just understanding it, but feeling it uh, and trying out being different and see what it feels like. And that can be a remarkable thing. So uh, I'm glad you you did that. The other um, thing I find clients really love is, you know, I worked mm -hmm. with someone who was abused by a mother's boyfriend, and and she got very overweight. That didn't. Then she got contact dermatitis on her inner thigh, and he found that revolting, and so that stopped all the abuse. And I said, but that's genius, the genius of your mind to come up with that, because when when you say to someone, you know, this, this is quite genius, you didn't want to fail at exams, and so you created this illness. I, I had a girl who was very badly bullied at school, single parent family, and she asked her mother, you know, can I stay home and never go to school? Mother said, don't, don't be silly, of course you can't. And then she asked her again about a month later when the bullying was getting really bad, I just want to stay home and never go to school. And she said, no, I have to go to a job I hate, you got to go to school. And then she got hypersensitive to light and couldn't leave the house at all. And obviously, she saw that this was the genie. She made a wish, and it made it real. But of course, all these years later, <clears throat> she can't leave the house because of this hypersensitive delight. And I said, but you know, that's actually genius that you thought a thought. I wish I could never leave the house, which is very seductive to a child. I wish you could stay home and watch cartoons and eat yogurt and never go to school. And amazingly, the brain, which is so tuned into your requests and desires, made it real. But I think it's also very important never to say, well, that was a silly thing, but to say, that's the genius of you. You could you could create something just with your mind. And if you could create it, now you can uncreate it because you're not a girl going to school and being bullied. You don't live with your mother and you live, you've got free range to do whatever you like, including going out and living a life without 
having this high percentage of delight and her, it, it all went away. It took a little while, but right. you began to go out more and more, stop burning and realize that, you know, I always say that, you know, this is the genie and it, it tries to make your wishes come true. But we so often right. wish for the wrong thing. I don't want to fail. I don't want to get that wrong. I don't want to mess that up rather than saying, I'm good. I want to succeed. I wish to do really well. My wish is to go to school and really do well at that debate rather than, oh God, I don't want to go and open my mouth and not and sound like an idiot. Well, and so I think that the language pattern of praising people for creating something they didn't want really helps them to get let it yes. go because they don't have to beat themselves up. Well, you give them an honorable exit from a situation yeah, where, exactly. and the symptoms are often a language of action rather than words. They can't negotiate oh. it verbally, so they do it physically. I, I oh. had a patient who had uh, non-epileptic seizures. You know, she would suddenly start to shake and and um, she'd been worked up and they didn't find any EEG abnormality. She was the the um, uh, a woman in a very wealthy wine family in Northern California and they were having tremendous battles uh, between the father and the sons who were taking over the business. They were dragging each other into court. She was trying to keep the family together. She tried to get them over for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and they'd all yell at her and yell at each other. And every day her father would call and yell at her about her brothers, and she just couldn't stand it. So she's having seizures, and it changed when her daughter had a baby, and uh, they wouldn't let her hold the baby because they were afraid that she'd have a seizure and drop the baby. And so that changed the balance. And I, oh. I, she was very hypnotizable, and I had her bring on the seizure. I said, have, let's have a seizure together. You can't get them to stop, but in hypnosis, you can get them to start. So we went back to the last time she had one, and she started to shake and have the tremor. And you're teaching her the control system. Mm. Uh, like with your patient, that, that your brain is telling your body what to do. You can, your brain can change that. And I said, so that's part one. You're going to practice every day having a seizure, and which seems kind of paradoxical, but she oh, did. I love that. Uh, and then I said, the second thing is you're going to teach your father a lesson. And that is if he yells at you on the phone, you hang up. And sooner or later, he will get the idea that if he wants to talk to his daughter, he's going to have to stop yelling at you. And so after a couple of weeks of her therapy for him, he stopped yelling at her on the phone and she stopped having the seizures and she got to be holding her baby. So it's tuning into the language that they have and it's a, a mind body language. And we underestimate tremendously how much control the brain has over the body and let's take full advantage of it. Yeah, and giving permission, and, people permission. You know, I love that expression, the feeling that cannot find its expression in tears will cause other organs to weep. And I've had that for people who shake. I think, I'd like you to shake even more. Can you 10x yes. the shaking? And then they think, oh, they just realize that they're controlling it. They can turn it up so they can turn it down. And I think it's a great thing that we're doing with our clients because we're showing them, look, you're, you're running the show. It, you're running it with your thinking, with your beliefs. But right. this is very good news because the, the easiest thing to change is your thinking. My, my dad screams, I'm going to hang up the phone. That's much easier than being medicated and and, right. and going to the doctor. I read that great book, All in Your Head, about that doctor who specialized in epilepsy, who I think it was Suzanne Summers, Dr. Susan. But amazing how many of her clients were creating it in response mm -hmm. to a crisis. And people just wouldn't yeah. believe that you, the mind could create epilepsy, but it mm -hmm. certainly can. So what got you to develop your uh, technique? How did what led Well, you? it was when I was working for Jane, and so many girls were anorexic. And Jane, you know, I love Jane Fonda, but she'd be the first one to admit she had a life of eating disorders. And I was just so <laughs> amazed that these people were trying to fix all these eating with, with aerobics and diets, and they lived on Diet Coke, Diet Hot Chocolate, Diet Oatmeal. Nobody ate any real food at all. And I, I found hypnosis and realized, because at the time my flatmate, one was anorexic, one was bulimic. They were great teachers for me. And it was both because of their relationship with their father. They both had the same thing, but they had a different reaction. It was so bizarre. Now, I remember talking to a client once in my class who said that when she was a young girl, she was anorexic and it all went back to she walked in on her father looking at porn magazines and doing something. And it really shocked her. And she thought a thought, 
I couldn't stand a man to look at me like that. But it was what we call an imprint. She was so distressed to see what, I mean, her father was a wonderful man, but that was just a sexual thing. It didn't have anything to do with his parenting, but she didn't understand that. So she thought this thought, I couldn't stand a man to look at me like that. And when you get breasts, that's what men do. So she immediately became anorexic, didn't develop. But someone in my class said, that's so funny because my father hated my mother and would drive me home after a visit with him and go, look at your mother, look at her in those tight clothes. She's just a tramp, look at her. And I thought the same thought. I couldn't bear it if a man talked about me like that. But I got fatter and fatter. So they both had a very similar thought. I would die if a man discussed me like that. And one stopped developing and the other became very overweight because they, but, and so I loved that. that. Isn't that amazing? The client thinks of thought, but they're certainly responsible for having a different reaction to the same thought. So working for Jane and having these two flatmates, bulimic and anorexic, I studied um, hypnotherapy with Gilboyne and then lots of other people too. And I just loved the immediacy of it, the fact that I could take my anorexic flatmate back to her father left and she felt not good enough and she wanted to say little girl because he loved the little girl but lost interest in her when she was a difficult teenager. And so she always felt that if she could just stay that little girl, he would still love her. And so I just I just found it, and I still do, like you, almost 40 years on, every time a client goes back to a scene, I find it so compelling. It's like they're showing you the story of their life, and you have the joy and the honor of giving that story a much better ending. And I always think that's such a gift we have. Mm -hmm. So I fell in love with hypnosis very early. But it was working mm -hmm. for Jane that um, brought on my interest and then using it to have my own daughter. And I've used it for so many things in my life. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been amazing. I've used it when I've had surgery. I've used it when I was writing books because it really, I'd tell myself, this is great. You can do this. Because of course, sitting down to write, it was so boring. It's so isolating. And you have to say, no, it's engrossing. It's compelling. And I find that one thing about hypnosis, even the walking hypnosis, that you can flip a word. So it's not scary. It's exciting. <clears throat> not anxious, I'm I'm ready. And so I found that's what really got me into it, how you could work with clients so quickly and turn something around. And people would, the one thing I heard all the time was, I've been in therapy for 10 years, or I've been seeing somebody for eight years. How come you could fix me so quickly? But it, yes. it's really the hypnosis, that is, because it goes straight to the root cause and, and starts to unravel it. Mm -hmm. I think so. And we, we were uh, thinking of talking about the mindsets and growth mindsets. And I think uh, one of the things that you I hear you doing is you're helping, you're giving them a sense of respect and adaptive creativity for something that they had previously conceptualized as a failing and weakness of theirs. You're saying you're helping them see what they did as a way of creating a resolution to a very difficult problem. Um, and yeah. helping them to feel better about it. And then you're saying, now, how can you emerge from this feeling better yet? Because you can recognize your adaptive attempt and find an even better way of resolving the situation. And so you're seeing the symptom as a, an attempted resolution rather than yeah. the evolution of a problem. Yeah, I always call it unfinished business. And I read a great book by Dr. Edgar Barn about how the mind becomes a judge, a juror, and a jailer. And I was always interested in how many clients, without meaning to create illnesses, like a child I worked with who got eczema because he watched his mother massage cream on the baby. He said, Mommy, can I have that? She said, no, you're a big boy. You can't have that. But he asked her every day, when are you going to put the cream on me? No, you're a big boy. And lo and behold, he got dermatitis. She was putting a lot of cream on him because he thought a thought. So it, that, that, the, the, the longing and the wishing for something that the body must make real, I find that when you look at people's illnesses, and a lot of the studies I've seen say up to 70% of illnesses are caused by disease thinking, but I think that's great news because it's much easier to fix a diseased thought than it is to fix a diseased organ. So when a client will, will work out, maybe it's a diseased thought that's caused this, we go, well, isn't that amazing? Because you can change that right now, but a diseased organ requires medication and well, antibiotics, but a diseased thought 
just requires reframing. And so I think it's good to have clients excited about their ability to finish the unfinished business and participate in their recovery and not say, I need the doctor, I need pills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the most simple things, like I, I never let people say, I've got my migraine or my cancer. I go, look, if you don't want to own something, never prefix it with my, call it the, then, then you have a bit of separation. It's not my anxiety or my irritable bowel. You don't own it. it, it it's the irritable bowel. And just take it, just changing that one word from mine to the allows them to separate from it. And I love it because my, of course, is an ownership word. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And I think often there's a saying that, you know, when you meet an obstacle in the road, it can turn into a signpost, you mm -hmm. know, that you can see it as a, a, a way to point yourself in a different direction. And that's um, taking that point of view that symptoms can be signals that you need to do something differently and adapt in a way that, that pain, which you call discomfort and calling it discomfort. Yeah. You're, 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 taking ownership of it and saying, I can do something about this. I can, yeah. I can and manage when it. I had, yeah. When I had a baby, I, I never talked about labor pains. I called it signals. But I didn't want to talk about going into labor because that word is very descriptive. And mm -hmm. so right. I find that's one of the lovely things about hypnosis. You use very descriptive words for good stuff and you minimize it all for negative stuff. A growth mindset is basically taking a situation um, and – seeing it as an opportunity uh, as well as a problem, uh, as, as an occasion for you to test your own creativity and adaptive ability and to get into a mindset of not so much focusing on results but on experience, verbs rather than adjectives, um, effort rather than results. Um, uh, to take a problem uh, like, for example, what Marissa and my wife Helen did with childbirth, is seeing it not as some horrible thing to go through, but an opportunity to expand your own ability to manage your discomfort and to start your life with your baby uh, on a good footing. So it's a way of feeling that um, you can make something of this more than just the obstacle or problem that it, it presents you with. Um, we recently published a study in psycho-oncology in which we taught growth mindsets to women recently diagnosed with breast cancer. And we found that just telling them to think about things like my body is capable, that um, the when, when the drugs I get cause me some discomfort, it's a sign that the drugs are working. So finding ways to see a difficult situation from a new point of view as an opportunity, an occasion to do something and do it better. Um, there's a there's a book called Zen and the Art of Archery, and the idea is that um, the the Zen way of looking at archery is that if you keep looking at the target, you're you're not going to do well. That what matters is the way you relate to the bow and arrow, and if your body connects with it properly, the arrow will go where it wants to go. That you focus more on the process than the outcome, and on learning to master and feel better about how you're handling the process. And so pain is a challenge, it's unpleasant, but it's an opportunity to learn how much your brain can process the pain and help you handle it differently. Um, so uh, if you like now, we can do a little self-hypnosis exercise where you can try out uh, adopting a growth mindset um, with something that's causing you stress and let's see how you do with it. So please get as comfortable as you can. Um, on one, do one thing, look up to the top of your head. On two, do two things, slowly close your eyes and take a deep breath. And on three, do three things, let the breath out, let your eyes relax, but keep them closed and let your body float. And then let one hand with the other float up in the air like a balloon. You may want to gently take the other hand and stroke the back of the hand that's going to float upwards from the tip of your fingers to your elbow and feel a sense of tingling, numbness, and lightness. And let your hand float up in the air like a balloon. And just notice 
pleasant sensations. Imagine your body floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or just floating in space as your hand floats up in the air. And let your body show you how it can respond to the way your brain is interacting with it. Now take a special kind of deep, comfortable breath in which you inhale through your nose, starting with your belly. Expand your belly, diaphragmatic inhale, then stop halfway. Now expand your chest completely. And then slowly exhale through your mouth. And again, inhale, starting with your belly, through your nose. Hold fill your lungs completely and slowly exhale. Now please notice how quickly and easily you're able to use your imagination to help yourself and your body feel better. Now picture in your mind's eye an imaginary screen. It could be a movie screen, a TV screen, or a piece of clear blue sky. And on the left side of the screen, picture one thing that's causing you stress or concern. And picture what it is about that thing that makes you feel so bad, but this with this rule, that no matter what you see on the screen, no matter what you think about it, your body is floating safe and comfortable. You're taking care of your body first. Each breath... Deeper and easier, nice, slow exhale. So notice how you've already been able to dissociate your physical reaction from the stressor that you're looking at on the screen. And now please think of this as an opportunity to shape a response that is something creative or new for you. A different way of handling that problem than you may have thought of before. So that the problem becomes an opportunity for you to test your own creativity at dealing with it. Body floating safe and comfortable. Problem challenge on the left. And playground on the right where you can try out a new way of adapting to an old problem. So that the problem becomes a challenge that gives you an opportunity to expand your array of capacities for dealing with difficulty. Another nice deep breath in, starting with your belly. Hold. Fill your lungs and then slowly exhale. Now just take a few moments to reflect on this experience, how you and your body feel and how you're able to take better care of your body, help it be comfortable as you face a problem and see this as an occasion to expand your ability to cope. Now we'll come out of this state of self-hypnosis by counting backwards from three to one. On three, you'll get ready. Two, with your eyelids closed, roll up your eyes. One, let your eyes open. Let your hand float back down, make a fist open. And that'll be the end of the exercise. Ready? Three, two, one. I just wanted to say one thing, because I think, Dr. Siegel, you've moved, the, you said earlier, you didn't really move the needle a lot, but I think you've moved it a huge amount, just by the fact that you have reverie and you're doing this for people. I think, you, I think you're such a name in the hypnotherapy field, and people really look up to you. I mean, I know I certainly do. I've quoted you so many times in my own book, so I think you might believe you haven't moved the needle, but I think you've moved it tremendously. Well, Very you. glad. I, 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 that's a hypnotic suggestion I will take to heart. Thank you. Oh, good. Yes, definitely take that to heart. 
So growth, you know, we we always want to expand. Expand means we're going out here and many of us are contracting. We, we, we're not expanding. Why we're not expanding? I mean, in my experience, I found it comes down to this, this fear of rejection. And we don't really understand the fear of rejection, but when you're born, you are hardwired to find connection and avoid rejection because that's how you make it. You know, where I live now, we've got all these little stray cats and they're very clever. They know if I rub my leg around that person in that house, she's going to feed me. So they're, they're very good at finding connection. They put up with being stroked. They avoid rejection because they, they're going to survive if they find connection, avoid rejection. Babies, we're all the same all through our life. We're looking to let me find connection and avoid rejection. And we're, we're scared of rejection because it wasn't that long ago that rejection would kill us. If, you know, you lived in a tribe and they banished you or you were cast out or marooned. My father, where he lived in Northumberland, they had a church with a banishment window. So people who were banished from the village because they didn't conform could come back and crouch down outside. And do it. But they had to leave before the service finished because they were banished and in Romeo and Juliet, when they banished him, he said, well, I'd rather be killed, frankly. There's nothing out there but purgatory. So we have a fear, and the fear is this. I might die if you reject me, and all these songs, I'll die if you leave me, I can't live without you, you're the only one for me. They don't actually help because they feed into this belief that we're fragile creatures, easily rejected. And the fear of being rejected is the thing that stops us growing. People say, you know, I could have written a book I wanted that promotion. I really wanted that job, but I didn't go for it. Why not? Well, they might have rejected me. And the underlying thing is in that that would kill me. I've had many clients, I'm sure Dr. Sfield does too, who say, well, I got dumped once and I've never had love anymore because I, I couldn't cope with the pain. There's a great song by Carly Simon called I Haven't Got Time for the Pain, and it's saying that thing. Right, right. It yeah. hurt me so much. I can't do it. And I have clients who say, I was bullied when I was a kid and I, I stay at home. I work, I couldn't go and work in an office because I might get rejected. And then we have to go back to the truth. The truth is once upon a time that might have killed you, but today, not only will it not kill you, will actually make you stronger. I can look back at being dumb, being fired and all the things that hurt me so much. It actually gave me a, I'll show you attitude. So the things that stop us growing and pursuing our goals are fears, and, and that we, we have very simple fears, the fear of being rejected, fear of not being good enough. And clients say, you know what, I've got self-sabotage and procrastination, but they are nothing more than an expression of, well, I'm not good enough. If I sabotage, you'll never find out. If I procrastinate and never write that book, uh, get that job, find that person, then how you'll never find out the unspeakable truth I'm actually not good enough. And I, I know that to be true because I work with so many famous people. Not long ago, I went to work with a really famous actor who was playing a very eminent person. He went, you know, who, who am I to do this? And I was like, isn't that funny? I'm thinking, who am I to help you? And you're thinking, who am I to play this? <laughs> and we good. both had imposter syndrome. I'm thinking, who right. am I to turn up and help someone as famous as you? And he was saying, you know, who am I to play this person that was so iconic? And we both had it, but, we, but what was different is we both had it, but we both did it anyway. So I'm going to do a little bit of hypnosis with you now to just take you back to where did you get this fear of rejection, this fear of not enough? You couldn't have been born with it. You know, no baby says, don't look at me. I've got no teeth, no three triple thighs down here and no hair. When we're born, we, we ha we're wired to believe that we're worth it, which is why babies demand attention and cry. Now, I have a great friend called Sammy Shoebox, and he's called Sammy Shoebox because he was put on a rubbish tip in the Philippines in a box, oh. in a shoebox, and he was left there for many days. And he, I think he was kind of crying, and people thought it was a little cat meow. But on day three, someone said, what is that noise? And off they went. They found this little baby in a shoebox. He was sent to America, adopted. He's just got his own child now. But his story is that he didn't give up. He cried for days because he had a belief someone is going to come and attend to my needs because I'm worth it. So my question is, where does that belief go? If we're born, if I shut my baby in a cupboard, and I'm sure if, if Dr. would shut his first son in a cupboard, they, they would have cried for a long time because they have this belief Someone's going to come and attend to me because I'm worth it. So where do we go from that to, well, I'm not really worth it. I'm not enough. I might be rejected. 
And th- and that's the thing that stops us expanding and keeps us going back is the fear. So we'll do some hypnosis and we'll just get rid of that fear because the truth is, as an adult, the only person with the power to reject you is you. Other people aren't really looking at you going, oh, you're no good, you can't do that, you're not attractive. It, it, you're the one who's saying it, oh, I can't do this or... It might not be good enough. So we need to shut that voice down and become our very own cheerleader. And I, I've just been in, I'm in Dubai, and only last week I was doing three classes a day in this one school, and all of the children were installing a cheerleader. They had a, they made the cheerleader, they gave it a name, and then they stood up and held it up, and they talked about And one little boy of eight said, it helps with my mental health. Another one said, it helps with my anger issues. And the third one said, it helps with my depression. I'm like... These eight-year-olds have depression. When I was a kid, an anger issue was called a temper tantrum, but now it's got a label, and it's so sad. But they love the children. They said, he believes in me. He tells me I can do it. They tell me to keep going. And so they all had a cheerleader. So I think today we'll, we'll have a cheerleader to get to make you not feel that you're easily rejected because the only person who can ever reject you is you, and the person getting in the way of your growth mindset it's really just your thinking, and we can all change that. So make yourself comfortable, and I want you to, I'm going to have you look up like that, keep your eyeballs up, close the lids down, just what Dr. Spiegel does, but in a slightly different way. So just imagine you're trying to look at your very own eyebrows, roll up your eyes, keep your eyeballs up, breathe in, breathe out. That's good, and again, breathe in. Every time you blink, deep hypnosis is coming upon you, breathe out. And just one more time, roll up your eyes, keep them up. And as you exhale, keep your eyeballs up, but just close your eyelids all the way down. Forget all about the position of your eyeballs. Just drop your chin so you have that looking down sensation. And I want you to imagine you are looking down 10 steps. You are moving on to step 10 as each muscle Every nerve turns loose, lets loose, and you go deeper. You're taking step nine and eight, and you can see your feet, hear your feet, feel your feet treading each step as you move down, drift down, travel down to an even deeper level. You're taking step seven, going deeper with every sound you hear. As you take step six, the sound of your own heartbeat is taking you deeper. You're taking step five as the sound of your breathing takes you deeper into an awareness of yourself. You're taking step four. You're taking step three. You're taking step two and one. Just go deeper, drift deeper, sink deeper. Just go deeper and deeper and deeper into an awareness of yourself. And as you go deeper, I want you to imagine, it's almost like you're looking at a screen and on the screen is you here today. You're looking at a video of you, but you're about to press rewind and go all the way back, all the way back to the time when you picked up a lie that you weren't enough, that you were easily rejected. So look at yourself on the screen, go ahead and press rewind. Mind and just notice yourself being pulled backwards, taken backwards. That movie of your life is rewinding, rewinding, rewinding. You are going backwards, 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 traveling back, moving back, all the way back, going right back to being a tiny newborn baby, going all the way back to the moment you were born. And you're looking at that little newborn baby and looking at the wonder of you. You were perfect. You were meant to be here. Somebody wanted you and wanted you to be here, and here you are. But I want you to imagine picking up that little baby and just asking that little baby a few questions. Are you happy? And if the answer is no, what is it that makes you unhappy? And if that answer is mom or dad or sister or school, What is it that mom or dad or sister or school or brother does or doesn't do that makes you unhappy? What is it that would make you grow up thinking you're not enough? What happened, what went on? 
to that sweet, perfect little baby that would make it feel somehow that it wasn't enough and was easily rejected. And I want you to imagine just taking that little baby back to wherever you live today. Just imagine transporting you and that little baby that used to be you, that younger you back, going to your home, wherever you live now, going through the front door. And as you go through the front door, I want you to repeat some words. I'm going to say something. I want you to repeat it pretty much word, but I want you to say to that little baby, I am becoming a loving parent to you now. Say that. Everything I'm going to say, I want you to say to no one in the world can play this role of loving parent to you like I can. I love you exactly the way you are. I love you completely. I love you unconditionally. Keep repeating these phrases, please. I will always have time for you. And I'll always listen to you. And I want you to imagine just taking that little child into your home and walking into your living room. And I want you to say to that child, I am upgrading you into my world now. And this is a nicer, safer, better place. <clears throat> Let's repeat that. I'm upgrading you into my world. You live in my world with me now. And as I upgrade you into my world, you can never go back to the other world, not even in your daydreams. And I want you to show that little baby that you're holding in your arms, your living room. And I imagine you have Alexa or Sonos or cable television. I'm sure you have an iPad, a computer, a mobile phone. And of course, none of us have those things. I didn't have those things when I was a child. They didn't even exist. They were not available to me. When I got older, I went out and got a mobile phone and a credit card and a car. I made all the things I wanted available. Of course, they are things. But many of us have a belief, love isn't available to me. Success is not available to me. Health is not available to me. And that simply isn't true. Everything is available to you right now. Everything's available. So I want you to imagine walking around the room and looking at all the things that you have made available to you, all the products you have. The fact that you drive a car because you can't be a child because you're doing so many other things. I want you to go into the kitchen and look at Everything you have, you can get out your card and have food delivered. You can have breakfast for dinner and dinner for breakfast. You can leave food. You can eat whatever you want, whenever you want. Because you're free now. I want you to go into your bathroom and look at all the products you have. Go into your bedroom and look in your cupboard at all the clothes you have that you get to choose. I want you to look at the bed you lie in. And I want you to go back again, holding that little babe in your arms, and I want you again to say, I'm upgrading you into my world. And this is a nicer, better, safer place. And now that you live in my world, you can never go back to the other world, not even in your daydreams, because life doesn't go back as it goes forwards. You're free. And the most important words you'll ever hear are the words you say to yourself. When you were that baby, the most important words you ever heard came from your mother, your father, the teacher, friends, siblings. But now the most important words you will ever hear come from yourself. As you look at that baby, I want you to say you're enough. Look at the baby and just say you are enough. You are lovable. You matter. You are significant. And again, look at that little baby who's so perfect and say, look at you. You're perfect. You're lovable. You're enough. You're deserving of everything just the way you are. And I want you to feel that little baby merging into you, merging into you, taking up residence in you as if you are creating a place in your home, in your heart, in your body, in your life for that child. 
And now that child lives in you. Now you've created a place in your heart, in your body, in your life, in your world for that child. Now they live in you. And you're becoming a loving parent yourself. You can't go backwards. Life doesn't go backwards. It goes forwards. You can never go back to whatever it was that made you feel not enough and easily rejected. You can only go forwards. And I want you to go forwards right now by repeating after me, I am enough. Say it, I'm enough. Say it again, I am enough. I have always been enough. I always will be enough. I'm enough. I am lovable. I'm significant. I matter. We're going to say this again. I want you to notice how you feel. Let's do it now and just tune into how you feel as you say, I am enough. I'm lovable. I matter. I'm significant. Some people say, you know, I feel so sad when I say this. Some people say, I feel sad. Some people say, actually, I feel quite angry because it isn't true. But here's the thing. Whatever you're feeling, you need to keep saying it until it just feels normal. We're going to make this familiar, so let's just do it two more times. Say out loud. And I want you to state it, affirm it, embody it. Say it with a voice that has more unshakable conviction in it. I am enough. I am lovable. I matter. I am significant. The words that follow I am are going to follow you. The words that go after I'm are going to go after you. So one more time, repeat after me. I am lovable. I am worthy. I am significant. I'm enough. And I want you to add just a few more I am's. I am amazing. I'm I'm interesting. I'm happy. I'm loved. You can say whatever you want. Because you're making these thoughts. And these thoughts are turning right around and making you. So just for another minute, just think about some of the I am's that you would like to follow you. I'm awesome. I'm a great friend. I'm an amazing parent. I'm an amazing partner. I'm a great employee or employer. You can take your pick. The words that follow I am will follow you. So let's do five I am's. Just say them out loud right now. If it feels silly, that's a sign you need to say it more until it feels familiar. And just imagine holding that baby all fused into one person, you and that baby saying, I am amazing, I am lovable, I matter, I'm significant, I'm enough. When you're a dependent child, you depend on other people to tell you those words. Of course you did, we all do. But as an independent grown-up, the most important word you'll ever hear are the words you say to yourself. It is your job to tell yourself you matter. It's no one else's job. Do not outsource that. You grow when you give yourself the missing words, when you can fill up the missing part of you with the words you've been waiting to hear your whole life. That's when you grow. So for the last minute, what were the things you always wanted to hear needed to hear? This is not rocket science. It was you're smart, you're beautiful, you're clever. I'm so lucky to parent you. How did I get such a great kid? Whatever you wanted to hear, let's say it now. I'm smart. I'm gorgeous. I matter. I'm interesting. I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of attention. I'm worthy of praise. I'm worthy of recognition. Now that you don't need to outsource that, you are growing in self-esteem, growing in self-confidence. Self-esteem is what you think of you, and you can grow that yourself just by getting into this state, playing this recording, and repeating these statements of truth. You matter. You're lovable. You're significant. You're worthy. So knowing it, feeling it, believing it, and most of all, continuing to do it because the mind learns by repetition. That's how we all grow. Just slowly, calmly, easily, effortlessly, just come back into the room, knowing that all of that stuff is behind you and you're not going backwards. You're going forwards. 
So come back into the room, open your eyes, take a deep breath. And thank you so much for spending the time to do this, to go on this journey to grow your self-esteem. Because no one else can grow it, but you can do it phenomenally. Thank you so much. Check out my next video here.